Hello and welcome to video 15 on uh, chemigation for soil infiltration problems. And if you take a look at the uh, image behind me, here on the bottom right hand side, you'll see it looks like uh, someone's furrow irrigating trees. Actually, that's drip irrigation with huge uh, infiltration problems. It's not unusual at all, uh, certainly in the Western United States. The topic of uh, infiltration problems uh, that you can remedy with uh, chemigation is, is found in the uh, textbook that we have that's available for free download. A total of 22 or 23 videos are available. Uh, part of them are lectures such as this one and part of them are uh, uh, videos of lab exercises uh, that we did since you can't come here personally. I started looking at these uh, infiltration problems uh, actually in the 70s uh, where when we started to put out drip irrigation we found that in some places uh, the water just stood on the, the uh, surface of the soil. By the way that problem doesn't disappear if you use SDI or subsurface drip irrigation. It may the water may just come right to the surface and uh, stand there. Uh, it's not only a problem though with uh, drip irrigation in some places, but it can be a problem with sprinklers, especially the high application sprinklers such as uh, pivots and linear moves uh, out on the uh, outer edges of them. So uh, I'll try to discuss, uh, you know, the chemical causes and the solutions here. Now here's the first big thing. If you read the far left, it says many of the infiltration problems are due to the irrigation water quality problems. In other words, something in the irrigation water isn't quite right. And then I uh, try to explain that this is different from inherent soil uh, problems, the chemical problems that are in the soil that you find such as what we call alkaline soils, where you have a high percent sodium as an example, or a high percent magnesium in the soil. So uh, what we have when we have a problem that's caused by the water is uh, generally we can't, in most cases, we can't remove everything from the water. So you need to have some continuous chemical amendment addition. In other words, you chemigate, you fertigate to avoid the ponding problem. Now keep in mind that this is not something that um, necessarily takes years and years to develop, although um, now, often people see an increased problem over time. All it takes is a, a you might think of a, a thin layer of plastic on the soil surface, you know, just a few mils thick or thousands of an inch uh, thick plastic. It, that's all you need to stop the water from going into the soil. So uh, what we have often is what's called deflocculation of the soil structure on the surface. Deflocculation means that the little individual fine particles of soil uh, are no longer really in a structured format. They, they uh, separate and they fall back in a tight, thin layer. And that's all it takes to stop water infiltration. As mentioned in earlier videos, um, sometimes you find uh, soils that have a lot of calcium in them, but the problem is it's not on the cation exchange capacity. Instead, it exists as free lime. And you can detect that by just dropping some acid like vinegar on the soil. And if it fizzes, there's a free lime. The reason this, reason this is brought up is that uh, the lack of sufficient calcium on the exchange sites is one of the major causes of infiltration problems. And often uh, in some form or another, the calcium is knocked off the exchange sites due to your irrigation water quality. In uh, places in the western U.S. where you have a lot of free lime in your soils, that's calcium carbonate, um, often what people do is uh, they put in, at least for surface irrigation, is in this picture right here, they put in sulfur-containing fertilizers such as calcium polysulfide, lime sulfur, ammonium polysulfide, uh, and ammonium thiosulfate. And uh, here's a picture, if, if you notice uh, directly above my head, there's a little um, bucket and there's a float in there that's one of these uh, float operated uh, mechanisms so that as a tank drains out 
and there's less and less pressure uh, on the uh, nozzle, actually uh, what happens is it just keeps that little bucket full and so the pressure on the uh, adjusting nozzle, the flow adjustment nozzle, stays the same. So uh, it's called a, a little float box. But anyway, it's a common way to treat uh, water for surface irrigation. And it frees up the calcium in the soil and improves penetration. Again, this is if you already have free lime in the soil. Now, this is the case where uh, anhydrous ammonia was uh, applied to furrows. And um, it was applied to the irrigation water. And I went out there to look at this cotton because the cotton wasn't doing too well. I uh, pulled some of the cotton plants out, uh, and and I'll be darned if they, they weren't really stunted. The roots didn't go down very deep at all. And uh, looking around, I realized that the furrows were cemented in. You know, it takes a little while to figure this out sometimes. And I looked over to the right of this picture, and there was an anhydrous ammonia tank. So sure enough, what had happened is they were putting in the anhydrous ammonia. It reacted in the water. Uh, the calcium fell out and uh, basically cemented the furrows and um, uh, the water didn't uh, infiltrate into the soil. So the uh, uh, needless to say, that's an infiltration problem. There is a, uh, another type of chemigation based solution for soils that inherently have low infiltration rates. And uh, this is a picture of of some people setting up what's called a PAM injection. PAM is polyacrylamide injection into irrigation water in a in a ditch, and uh, it's for furrow irrigation. But uh, certainly there there are special injectors. Uh, I've used them on center pivots, for example, uh, where you can mix uh, PAM. You, you don't just inject it normally because it it turns into a, kind of a slime and you need a special injector to mix it with the water. But um, anyway, there are a number of these polymers that you can uh, put in, and, and basically what they do is they, uh, they avoid the deflocculation. They actually create better aggregates in the soil. And on the right-hand side, what you see is two cylinders uh, with tailwater at the end of furrows. And, and what you can see is the one on the left has no sediment in it at all, and that's because after treatment with PAM, the soil had much better structure. So this doesn't obviously show anything about infiltration problems, but what you do see is, is the particles, of the fine particles of soil did not just uh, break down and uh, wash away with the uh, irrigation water. On the right, you see a lot of sediment, of course, and, and that's exactly what happens. So uh, this is also used, certainly, and this demonstrates it, it's used to control uh, erosion problems with furrows as people inject PAM. They do it a variety of ways. Like I said, there are special injectors for pivots. Uh, here they're putting it in the irrigation water itself. And some people even go as far as just putting a teaspoon or so of PAM at the head of every furrow when they furrow irrigate. Now, chapter 19, gets into some things that are a little heavy in terms of um, uh, chemistry, but uh, hey, that's the way it goes. If, uh, if water quality problems are chemistry problems, uh, if you actually really want to understand them, you have to know a little bit about the chemistry. So here are some of the water quality conditions. Remember, this is the irrigation water, that these are water quality conditions that can uh, contribute to water infiltration problems. First, there's something called a high adjusted sodium adsorption ratio. Now, and then RNA, you know, it's like a ratio with Na. So let's look at the words here. High, if the number's high, it's bad. Uh, there's some adjustment. That refers to um, the fact that you have to take a look at whether or not uh, some of the calcium in the water will be tied up with uh, carbonates. And then sodium, let's see, high sodium. So sodium in the water is bad. How's that? That tends to deflocculate things. Adsorption, that's a term that we have, remember, when cations are attracted to the cation exchange capacity. It's not absorption, but that electrical interaction, the combination 
we call adsorption, and then there's a ratio of something. So you're looking at ratios of this and that, and you go to a table. The next one is low EC. What's EC? EC is electrical conductivity. If you don't have much electrical conductivity, that means low salinity. Believe it or not, believe it or not, if you have very pure water, that can cause infiltration problems. Basically, the uh, the irrigation water is so pure, it scavenges uh, the uh, good cations like calcium right off the exchange sites. Then you have high ratios of magnesium to calcium or the combination of magnesium plus calcium uh, plus sodium uh, compared to calcium. Another one is if you have fairly pure irrigation water, you want to avoid fertigating with monovalent cations such as ammonium. Uh, it'd be better to use something like uh, calcium nitrate. Granted, it's more expensive, but it can make a, quite a difference on infiltration problems. And anyway, these are discussed in this uh, video. What this slide says basically is, hey, tough luck. If it's the uh, water chemistry and you want to understand it, you have to understand a bit of chemistry because the solutions are chemistry based. What we're trying to do here really is is help you avoid um, just buying some magical treatment that may actually not be magical. It may be a very good treatment, but perhaps for something other than what you're facing. And um, I, I see this, you know, like uh, people apply things in in drip systems to prevent plugging. But the problem is their their plugging may be caused by mineral deposits, and instead they're putting in plugging solutions that are designed for bacteria problems. You know, in other words, you have to have the right pill or the right medicine. Now, this is nothing but fun here. Uh, high adjusted sodium adsorption ratio, there's a detailed discussion, but basically this deals with constituents in the water. And you can see there's this ratio here, adjusted RNA, and uh, it's um, sodium's on the top. So let's see. A high number if you have a lot of sodium that's going to be a problem but it's not just the amount of sodium it's the ratio of the sodium to this other stuff and the other stuff is calcium plus magnesium that's on the denominator and there there's that x on the calcium and that means that if in your water you also have high bicarbonates and carbonates um, those will combine in the soil with the calcium and drop it out. So it means you actually have to kind of derate, not kind of, you have to derate the calcium concentration that you find in the water. One of the solutions, of course, is, is for infiltration problems that we use when, when water is kind of right on the borderline is we add acid, which burns out the bicarbonates and carbonates. It just turns them into CO2 gas. And uh, that helps with this ratio. In other words, the CAX becomes larger and therefore the adjusted RNA becomes smaller, which is good. Now, it turns out that some years ago that um, people who are looking at water quality uh, found out that it's not just that ratio, but it depends on the salinity also. Uh, and and you, so you have to look at these two things together. And then this is the permeability hazard um, then of irrigation water, when you look at the salinity and you see there are three levels, none, slight to moderate and severe problems, depending on the salinity. So those numbers down there are, are salinity numbers and then adjusted RNA. For example, let's take a look at, uh, you have an adjusted RNA of, of, um, zero to three. It's a low number. And uh, you look over to the far right, it says less than 0.2. It says, wow, if you have very pure water with very little salinity, less than two, what are called decisiemens per meter. And certainly we have that in some places in the Western US, uh, you know, where the water comes from uh, uh, granitic sources. Uh, as opposed to sedimentary sources, it, it comes off the Sierras or sometimes off the Rocky Mountains, and it has not gone through any marine layers. It can have almost no salt in it. So let's see, this says, this is the top line of numbers. It says, you know, you can have this water that with that adjusted RNA, it looks really good. So small RNA, 
But if you have, if you have very pure water, you're still going to have very severe infiltration problems. On the other hand, you could look at down below on the left, it says adjusted RNA is really high. It's 20 to 40. So that's really a high value. And you can have no problem at all with infiltration if you have a salinity of 5 decisiemens per meter. Of course, that'll kill your plants, but uh, hey, the water's going to get in the ground. So uh, th this gives you an idea. There's an interaction of, of uh, what's going on. Gives you, you, you can run the formulas. The book tells you how to do it. So again, here's another example. This one is right in the middle of the table. It says the adjusted RNA is, is 10. So see that falls between the 6 and the 12. Obviously, these aren't exact numbers, but you know, you get a range. And you have an EC extract of 1.0 decimus per meter. See, that's in between 1.9 and 0.5. So you would have a slight to moderate permeability hazard. So what what could you do? You could, what are your choices here? To, sh to move over to the left, to move over to the left, what it says is you could increase the salinity. In other words, greater than 1.9. Now, if you increase the salinity, you have to be a little careful. You don't want to just dump sodium salt in there because that would also increase the adjusted RNA. But if you put calcium salts in, that'll shift it over to the left. Or maybe if you have um, a lot of bicarbonates in the water, you could shift this, you could shift it up a little bit, and and um, you you could move it kind of up and to the left a little bit by getting rid of the bicarbonates. So again, to repeat some of the conclusions, the purer the water you have, like what we have in some places, the Western US, the greater the permeability hazard will be. It's a water quality thing. You notice that uh, it's a concrete stand. It's sitting in the side of an irrigation canal. Uh, there's no water at the moment. That's why you can see the exposed part of it. But if you notice the calcium, from the cement, uh, from the concrete, has uh, been removed. It's actually been leached out, and you can see the the aggregate uh, that's exposed. Uh, this water is so uh, pure, coming out of the Sierra Nevadas right there, that that's what it does. It just and it does the same thing in the soil. It pulls the calcium right off the cal uh, the cation exchange capacity sites. And um, then the soil tends to deflocculate. Even even uh, soils like um, a sandy loam, which you would think, wow, that, that thing has got to have a high infiltration rate. Uh, the problem is if you put these um, uh, the real pure water on it, especially if the sandy loam has a lot of mica in it, uh, the particles will uh, deflocculate and they just settle on top of each other and seal the soil up. Back to how you can modify things. It's very common in some areas to apply gypsum, and that's calcium sulfate. The, the correct term would show a couple of uh, water molecules on the right-hand side, but uh, anyway, it's calcium sulfate. So it's a salt. It doesn't dissolve very well, but it breaks into calcium and sulfate. Calcium is uh, good. In other words, if you can increase the percent of calcium in the water, compared to sodium, the adjusted RNA will decrease. And then also what will happen when you put in this salt is uh, that helps out. Because remember that if you can, can have um, a little saltier water of the good kind, of course, with calcium, and a higher percent calcium, you're not getting rid of the sodium. What you're doing is you're improving the ratio by increasing the calcium. Uh, you move things to the left and up. In other words, you get closer to the none category. And again, to repeat, if you can remove carbonates and bicarbonates from the water, then the adjusted RNA gets lowered, and that's good. In other words, you move upward on the chart. And obviously, there, there are some solutions such as uh, 
you know, solutions where you put acid or SO2 into the water that work great uh, in improving infiltration in some places. Uh, in those some places, or if you have carbonates and bicarbonates, if you don't have those in the irrigation water, uh, it's not going to uh, really help out. Just to repeat what I said before, you can't get rid of the sodium in our irrigation water, you know, unless you have desalination or something like that, but uh, that's not in the cards for most people. And uh, so it's a nice idea, but uh, it's not really a consideration to remove sodium. So again, common solutions are uh, injecting gypsum, that's calcium sulfite, uh, <laughs> calcium sulfate. And uh, it's not the same as lime, if you recall. And it has to meet some specifications. It, very pure, very finely ground. It's uh, not just typical mined gypsum. Uh, well, it depends on where the mine is. And uh, you inject it at a rate that is uh, lower than the rate at which it can be dissolved. In other words, you don't uh, start just putting out gypsum particles. And um, you're increasing the good salts and reducing the adjusted uh, RNA. And then the other one is acidification of the water pH uh, if it's high, and that removes the carbonates and bicarbonate. Something to consider is the ease at which, with which you can flip the chemistry it depends on how much salt is in the water. Uh, if you don't have very much salt in the water, it's very easy to shift the uh, chemistry one way or the other. In other words, you can mess it up or you can improve it without a lot of extra chemical. Um, so uh, it's kind of like putting acid on sandy soils. If you put acid on sandy soils, you can flip that pH in the soil really quickly and actually uh, uh, kill your uh, kill your crop. The, the acid uh, can go down and dissolve the aluminum in the soil and uh, Bam! There goes your uh, your crop. Uh, I mean, within a couple of days. So um, it, it's kind of equivalent to have very pure irrigation water. Sands have almost no cation exchange capacity, so it's easy to flip the chemistry. Uh, what you see in this photo is a um, typical, rather typical gypsum injection setup. What they have is a silo there. Uh, they can fill, instead of uh, filling some unit with bags every once in a while, they have a truck that comes in and, and uh, fills up that silo. And on the bottom of it, you can see a tube going over. That's uh, basically a feeder screw. And uh, you can uh, continuously or occasionally uh, fill up that uh, white box. The box has a mixer in it. And so what you have there is a mixer of gypsum with your irrigation water and then there has to be a little pump to put that uh, into your irrigation system. Always do it upstream of the filters. Um, you can really regret it if you don't. And you use this very pure, what's called solution grade, fine gypsum, uh, and you have to do it at a dissolvable rate of less than a thousand parts per million of dihydrate. And here is the first time you see the two water molecules on the uh, attached to the end of the uh, uh, calcium sulfate part of it. There are different forms of gypsum, and the dihydrate uh, dissolves a little better than the other forms. And so that's going to depend on, on where this is mined. It's, it's not something they add to the gypsum. It's the way it's formed naturally. So what you do is you purchase an excellent mixing machine, an excellent automatic gypsum feeder, and in addition, you, uh, if you have to add acid, you, you do that also, maintain a pH of about 6.5. And um, that, if it's a chemistry problem associated with the adjusted NA, uh, uh, RNA, if, if it's that, you know, in other words, it's a chemistry-based thing. If the formula show, you run the formula with the existing water quality and with an increased uh, calcium concentration, and see what the impact should be using that uh, table that I showed you before. So there's no magic here. So this is to beat it to death, and simply because this chemistry stuff with water is, is really new for a lot of people. They're so accustomed to looking at um, the soil as a problem, because after all, they see the problem in the soil. But uh, this is dealing with water quality. So you do very finely pure, finely ground gypsum, you sometimes dissolve it and inject it. 
and it, it increases the salinity, and but it's a good salt and also reduces the adjusted RNA. By the way, uh, you can't put um, lots of gypsum on and overload the soil. It, it turns out it's not soluble enough. It's not like um, sodium chloride or you know other types of salts, uh, especially the chloride salts, where you can really have a very high uh, salinity in the soil and then that just wipes out your plants. Gypsum has a maximum to it. it uh, once the uh, salinity gets high enough, it just drops out in the soil. And uh, so it's sort of like self-regulating. So we have a lot of uh, soils with um, high gypsum in them and it's not a problem. This uh, figure here uh, takes a little bit of looking to understand it. But uh, forget the uh, blue right now, unless it's just an indicator. The blue is a vertical line, goes to 8.2 for a seawater pH. But if you look at the carbon dioxide, uh, that's CO2, and um, that's kind of an orangish color. And then bicarbonate, that's a sort of purple color. And then the green one is carbonate. Let's see. What this shows you is that uh, there, there are a number of chemicals that work this way. Uh, that the, this somehow carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, carbonate, exactly the form that it that it exists in uh, in the water depends on the pH. Uh, we have a similar thing with uh, chlorine. Believe it or not, it changes uh, state depending on the pH. So if you look at this right here, really the thing to look at is that um, uh, somewhere around 6.5, 6.3, this is 6,3, it's more of a European thing here, uh, the way it's done in some countries. So the 6,3 is actually 6.3. Let's take a look at that point. Uh, look down below on the pH value, and that's about 6.3 where that is. And look on the vertical scale, and that's 50%. What this says is, let's see, the only colors right there are orange and purple. And it says that essentially half of the potential bicarbonate is left. And also you see no green, there's no carbonate. And this is basically about where we try to get the pH when we have carbonate and bicarbonate. What you can see if we start way over on the right at 12, that this chemical, this chemical exists, almost 100% of it is carbonate. You have a lot of that in the water. And remember, what the carbonate's gonna do is when the carbonate is in the water and then it gets in the soil, the carbonate will combine with calcium that's on the exchange sites and drop it out as calcium carbonate or lime. It'll extract it from the exchange sites which is bad. So as you acidify the water from this very extreme value of 12, which we don't have, and shift it to the left here, reduce the pH, what happens is the carbonate concentration goes down and that is replaced by bicarbonate. You can see as you're going to the left from that extreme right-hand side, the green goes down, the purple goes up. And so right at about 8.2 at seawater uh, pH, you really don't have much in the way, excuse me, uh, yeah, 8.2. Uh, the carbonate's pretty well gone, but you have a lot of bicarbonate. But if you continue to acidify the water, you can see that the bicarbonate concentration goes down. And, uh, and that's about where you want to be at around six and a half or so. Remember, that's a pretty good pH for nutrient availability, for plant health, and also for infiltration if you have problems with carbonates and bicarbonates in the water. So what are the solutions? Basically, there's, there are two solutions that uh, people tend to use. Now remember, the thing is, this is continuous. So, well, you could put in um, something like urea sulfuric acid, um, and uh, that would do the job. In other words, it would drop the pH, and um, 
you know, that, that would knock out the carbonates and bicarbonates. The problem is, is there are times of the year when you don't want uh, nitrogen. And plus, you're paying for the acid, plus the nitrogen, and maybe all you want is the acid at certain times. So, uh, yes, it'll do the trick, but uh, most people don't use it on a consistent basis. So, the first one is sulfuric acid that's used. It, remember, it's dangerous to handle. That was in the safety uh, video. So, a lot of farmers hire special companies to set it up, and the farm workers never touch it. And uh, no, no doubt it's, it's dangerous. Like sulfuric uh, is real dangerous, whereas urea sulfuric, you know, if you get it on your hands, at least you can wash your hands off and the hand is still there. Not with sulfuric acid. It'll just eat you up. Um, then there's sulfurous, which is not so well understood. It's H2SO3. If you notice, it, instead of sulfate, SO4, this is SO3. It's kind of a strange um, compound. Uh, generally, we, we make it on site with what are called SO2 generators. And uh, there's a whole separate ITRC video on this. It's a weaker acid. This, is, again, is one where you can put your hand in it, pull it out. Not that I'm recommending this. You know, wash it off, and uh, you still have your hand. Uh, it's also used by some people to reduce uh, bacteria populations in drip hoses and emitters. So there's a, another benefit. And then there are details like it being having some residual once it gets in the soil. Again, there's a whole video on this. This is one of the apparatuses that's uh, common in uh, the Western US. Uh, it happens to be a Harman SO2 generator. And uh, there are bags of sulfur there, and people manually put the bags into the hopper. It's like feeding a fireplace, you know that long uh, vertical, larger diameter uh, pipe is a hopper. It has a little uh, lid on it. And uh, there's a fire, actually, uh, that burns the sulfur. So it takes elemental sulfur. It's in prill form, small, very pure. Um, it burns. Uh, when it burns, it uh, makes SO2 gas. That's why it's called an SO2 generator. Then uh, if you follow through the mechanism it's in, described in the book, the SO2 gas is then combined with the irrigation water in a scrubbing chamber. And that's where you see that little, little smoke coming out of that. And uh, there's a scrubbing chamber. And then it uh, falls down and it, in the form of H2SO3 or sulfurous acid. And um, in this case, you can barely see on the right-hand side, there's a pipe going out into that reservoir. And uh, this particular outfit uh, has uh, lots of acres of almonds and pistachios and that, um, probably as many as, I guess, somewhere around 80,000 acres. And they have a lot of these reservoirs where they blend uh, well water and surface water for good flexibility, drops out the sand. But they have algae problems, or they did have algae problems. And so by injecting this into the irrigation water, um, upstream of their pumps and filters. What they did is they first cleaned out the uh, algae. We do that at Cal Poly too. That's what we do for our reservoirs. Um, we inject, um, we use these machines and inject it into our uh, reservoirs and it helps keep them clean. So it not only uh, keeps the water clean that way, but it uh, helps with infiltration problems. So sulfuric acid uh, injection is um, uh, a little more complex because of the danger associated with it. Uh, this is a standard uh, commercial unit that uh, I believe this is by Vertical Brothers. You know, they have this distinctive orange color. They have a special pump that's designed for acid injection. It's all set up by the company itself. They have the sulfuric acid tank inside of another tank for security. In other words, they're really trying to go the whole nine yards with uh, safety. A few more details. I mentioned that ammonium fertilizer with real pure water tends to reduce infiltration rates. So you use nitrate forms uh, instead. Again, this is if you have very pure water. And uh, many of you won't, but some of you will. And then um, the, you really want a lot of calcium uh, compared to uh, magnesium and sodium. And this is a ratio that looks a bit different than the, the adjusted RNA or the adjusted sodium adsorption ratio. 
uh, you definitely want to keep the calcium up there. Interestingly enough, some of the formulas have magnesium as a, a good guy, and some of them, like in this case, have it as a bad guy for infiltration. We know that in groundwater wells that have high serpentine rock sources, um, where there's a lot of uh, magnesium that comes out of the serpentine, uh, th this ratio will actually be flipped. There'll be so much magnesium compared to calcium, it's flipped, and you, you really have to uh, inject gypsum to flip it back the other way and uh, get more calcium than magnesium. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of video number 15, which deals uh, with infiltration problems due to water quality problems uh, that can be resolved with chemication. Have a good day.